and China is not copying on the United States. China is not copying on the civilized world. China is exploring its own way. Look at the political system. China is not doing the two-party or a free election or the Western-style democracy. And it is exploring a new structure that would better serve uh, the majority of the people. And for economic development, we are not building Manhattans or New York or London. Um, we are trying to improve productivity and build up a harmonious society, the harmony between economic, political, and social and econo uh, ecological areas. Harmony between moral and material. Harmony between the East and the West. Harmony between uh, the urban and the rural areas. Harmony between um, culture and uh, spiritual and material. So we are trying, we are learning, we are exploring. This is a road untrodden. So we are making mistakes. And mistakes are unavoidable. Definitely we are learning from the West. We are learning from their experiences. We are also learning from their uh, bad uh, lessons. But the world is not ideal. Um, even though we understand we cannot avo avoid mistakes. For example, the population control. And now we have 1.3 billion. And the West, I heard the West criticize China's one-child policy saying it is unhuman, it is a violation of human rights. Look at today. If we don't have the one-child policy, our population would exceed 1.8 billion, about 2 billion people. How can this land support this large population? If every four of them buy a car, there would, there would be 500 million cars. So um, I think what is more important is uh, the, this interdependence uh, should make us clear that we are living in one world. We have one dream. We have one objective. Everybody has its own ob uh, responsibilities. Everybody has its own role to play. The developed countries, you're you uh, you very strong in high tech. They use energy economically. Then why don't you introduce the high tech to the, the poor countries? When we buy uh, the technology, it is not given free, it is very expensive. And sometimes you refuse to, to sell it to us. So we do our job. We take care of the environment in our country and let's help each other. And if you have good technology, sell us. And to those victims of this climate change, those uh, underdeveloped countries do need help. If this country, uh, this world is not developed in balance, this, the, the, the world will not be harmonious. We are still in danger. There will be conflict, there will be wars, there will be disputes, endless disputes, and the human progress will be slowed down. Well, thank you very much for, for that admonition. I'm glad to hear that China and other countries are learning from the mistakes in the West. I wish we in the West would learn from our own mistakes and show that we're willing to make the changes. It's, we're we're t lecturing people, but not making the changes where we're at. And uh, I think your admonition was well taken. So if we could start with the, uh, the questions. Don, you want to start off? My name's Don Johnston, and uh, I'm a former Canadian politician, former Secretary General of the OECD, uh, currently Chair of the International Risk Governance Council here in Geneva, and also am advisor to a foundation focused on environmental issues, amongst others. And um, I'd like to pick up on the last comment by, by our, our Chinese host. And first of all, I thought the panel was terrific, by the way. I mean, I really enjoyed the, all the interventions. But when you talk about China and, and, and we have the aspiration issues, I mean, I've spent quite a bit of time in China over the last 10 years, and it looks increasingly like New York to me. And uh, I think that's got to be a question of major concern. And then you have the interesting thing you raised about the one-child policy, which uh, the economists would say, with the growth paradigm described by Professor Barber, that's the wrong policy because your population is going to go into decline starting about 2020, and therefore the growth numbers which you need basically to raise the standards of living to the 
say what we like in the United States and the consumer societies of the West is not going to happen. So those are some of the dilemmas, and these are just some of the, the features that have been brought out, I think, in this discussion. But I have a question for the panel as a whole. I see some gray hair up there, which is, which is good. And um, Professor Barber is pleading his, his uh, age and experience. Well, I graduated from law school in 1958. I remember the Stockholm Conference of uh, 1972. Um, then we had, of course, uh, the Groharms book in uh, Our Common Future in 1989. We had the Real Conference in 1990. We had Ungas in 1997. We've had Kyoto. We've had Bali. Why do you think Copenhagen is going to be any different? And I have to say that I detect, and I hope that we all walk out of here with uh, some realistic views, but I, I don't walk out of here very optimistic, and I'm not optimistic to begin with about the outcomes from Copenhagen, and I sense that amongst the panelists. So the real question is, if Copenhagen fails, I don't think it'll fail in terms of rhetoric. None of the other conferences have failed in terms of rhetoric. They'll be terrific. We'll hear lots of wonderful, you know, resounding phrases coming out of everybody. And I might say in that context to our Chinese guests that democracies are a problem because maintaining a consistent policy in this area, which is absolutely essential in the long term, uh, is very, very difficult. I mean, witness the United States. We've had a major shift, you know, from the Bush administration to the Obama administration. That could shift back. That could shift some other direction. So to maintain a credible long-term environmental policy is difficult. But I frankly don't see anything happening that's going to basically stop CO2 emissions from rising uh, over the next number of years. Nothing. I mean, I, China is going to be dependent primarily on coal. Uh, the clean coal technology is not going to solve those, those, those emission problems sufficiently. We're going to hit 450. I think we'll hit 550. I mean, from what I read, and I'm not an expert in the area, but I'm kind of on Ludlock on this, I mean, who's become increasingly pessimistic. So the question is, what are the alternatives? And uh, there's been an increasing interest in, in geoengineering, which you may have noticed. There was an article in Foreign Affairs, and actually, Ranger Morgan wrote that. He heads our science committee at the, at the uh, IRGC, and David Victor from Stanford, and others, these are serious people, started to look at the issue of geoengineering as a last resort, an on-the-shelf solution that we should keep out there in the event that we are never able to come to a consensus on basically reducing, capping, whatever technique we use to put a price on carbon. Now, does the panel, first of all, I'd like to ask them, is anybody up there optimistic about the outcome from Copenhagen? I didn't hear it, uh, but I didn't hear it from David Suzuki on that, on that subject. And that's the first question. The second question is, if you're not optimistic about the outcome from Copenhagen, what do you see going forward? I'm not optimistic for the reasons that I think we'll be talking about the wrong subject. We'll be talking about environmentalism and containing CO2 emissions. And we should be talking about sovereignty. We should be talking about global governance. We should be talking about how we can change a paradigm in which we cherish our interdependence. It's, uh, independence is hard. Rights talk, I mean, uh, the one-child policy is deeply repressive of individual rights and the individual right to choose. It's absolutely prudent with respect to China's position in a world of, of uh, uh, global warming, without question. But it is also repressive and damaging to human rights. But human rights stands in tension with the goals of environmentalism. That's one of the problems. I mean, you know, we, uh, we all talk eventually. We all want a right to breathe and to so on. But short term, we want the right to do what we want to do. The reason the automobile is so powerful is that, it's, as was said a long time ago, it's a four-wheeled ideology. You know, it's, it's an ideology of getting your own car. You can, you can get anywhere. You're mobile. You can make love in your car. You can eat in your car. You can work in... I mean, the automobile is an ideology of radical individualism. And the reason the Chinese want it is precisely because they've lived in a relatively collectivist society aimed at harmonious integration, and they want the other side. They want the individualism. They want their cars the same way every people has. The car is a seductive you know, thing that, uh, that is related to the rights revolution. It's not, an, you know, it's, not a, it's not a contingency that automobiles developed in the rights-based world. So, I mean, I think to be successful, Copenhagen is going to have to face the fact that while we have emissions without frontiers, we don't have citizens without frontiers. And until we have something like Citoyens Sans Frontières, until we have some forms of global governance, they can take on in the same perhaps repressive way that China takes on its problems, take on the problems of global warming, state by state by state it won't happen because if two or three states sit out the way they did in the League of Nations, 